Welcome everybody. My name is Mark Cosgrove. I'm co-founder of Cinema Rediscovered Festival and delighted to welcome you to this special event. One of the great things about um, setting up a festival, about programming it, is serendipity and the way things just, uh, you realise that the connections are happening in the festival that you just hadn't realised uh, were there. Um, and one of the first films that we confirmed for this year's festival was the UK premiere of the restoration of the 1966 uh, A Man Called Adam, which features a star-studied African-American cast, including Sammy Davis Jr., Ossie Davis, Cicely Tyson, and a certain musician, Louis Armstrong. Just in the past few weeks, we confirmed a preview of the restoration of Bert Stern's uber-stylish and hit documentary on the 1958 Newport Jazz Festival, featuring legendary musicians like Thelonious Monk, Jerry Mulligan, Mahalia Jackson, and a certain Louis Armstrong. Then someone pointed out that the, this is the 50th anniversary of Armstrong's death in 1971, which coincidentally is a year that we are looking at in Hollywood during the festival. We felt we just had to mark the moment and asked our friends at Bristol Blues and Jazz Festival if they wanted to partner on an event. And now I'm delighted to welcome the Bristol Blues and Jazz Festival director, Denny Eilert, in conversation with director of research collection for the Louis Armstrong House Museum in Queens, New York, Ricky Ricardo. As they say, take it away. Right, everybody. Uh, my name is Denny Eilert. I am the artistic director for the Bristol Jazz and Blues Festival. And uh, I believe that I'm talking to you from the Watershed Cinema, where you're about to watch one of two very special films that the uh, cinema is showing this uh, month. And that is A Man Called Adam and Jazz on a Summer's Day. And I'm delighted to welcome the man that ties these two films together because he is the director of research collections at the Louis Armstrong House Museum in New York, the one and only Mr. Ricky Ricardo. Welcome, Ricky. How you doing, Danny? Hello, everybody. Good, good, good. Now, um, that very illustrious job title, um, uh, Director of Research Collection, tell us a little bit about what that actually entails for you. Sure. Well, some of you might know that Louis Armstrong lived in Queens, New York for the last 20 years of his life and his house is a museum. But we also have the world's largest archives for any single jazz musician. And that's what I'm in charge of. I'm in charge of Lewis's tapes, his scrapbooks, his record collection, his trumpets. Uh, it's a constantly growing collection and it's all been digitized. You could all check it out online at uh, lewisarmstronghouse.org. And for me as an Armstrong nut, it's a dream job. I can tell you that. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's well documented, isn't it? That Louis was a, was a serial archivist, I guess. I guess if he was around in this day and age, he'd be the ultimate Instagram influencer, wouldn't he? Oh, if he was around today, he would have every social media. He'd be on Snapchat. He'd be <laughs> he'd be doing everything. Uh, I, I sometimes feel like he almost invented that kind of stuff because you hear yeah. him on these tapes where he's sitting by himself and he's addressing this imaginary audience. And he's, you know, he's ordering Chinese food for lunch and he's telling you what he's listening to and what the weather is and all that kind of stuff. And there's nobody there. And so it's like, he knows that one day, you know, 40, 50 years from now, this would be considered a live stream. So <laughs> it's it's a delayed live stream, but we have all the, uh, the tapes, it's unbelievable. What was the quote? It's for posterity. That's it. That's the most important phrase we have in our archives. We have a tape where Lewis and his wife Lucille get into a pretty nasty argument and she doesn't know he's taping it. And when she discovers he's taping it, she tells him to turn off the tape recorder and erase the tape. And he says, no, it's for posterity. <laughs> <And so. laughs> Wonderful, yeah. wonderful, wonderful. So um, we're, we're going to have a little talk about Louis' film career. I mean, obviously, his music career is well known, well documented. Uh, we have all the albums and the CDs and videos to watch of him in performance. But um, I mean, maybe his film career doesn't get talked about as much. So so um, do you know how many movies Louis appeared in through his career? I think it's 35, somewhere around 35 movies in about 30 years or so. So yeah, it's a well, substantial career. Starting when? When was when was when was the first? Well, the first one is Lost, unfortunately. It's X Flame. That's the one he filmed in Los Angeles in 1930. He had the Les Heights band with Lionel Hampton and Lawrence Brown. There's photos, there's advertisements. 
the film has not turned up. So that's still kind of the uh, the holy grail for Armstrong collectors. We hope one day that shows up. And then he made a couple of shorts for Paramount. He did Rhapsody in Black and Blue. He appeared in a Betty Boop cartoon. Um, and then there's the famous Danish footage from 33 of him on stage in, in Copenhagen. But really, the film career, you could say, legitimately starts in 1936 with Pennies from Heaven, a Bing Crosby film. Yeah. yeah. And that was that was the first time an African-American ever got equal billing and featured billing alongside all the other white stars. Lewis's name was above the title. It was with the same billing, same font, same everything. And that had never happened before. And so he was very, very proud of that movie. I mean, being that it was that time, you know, when things were very difficult for African-Americans to break into the mainstream, would Bing Crosby himself have had something to do with that? Bing had everything to do with that. Yeah, yeah. Bing knew that without Louis Armstrong, there'd be no Bing Crosby. And by 1936, Bing was kind of king of the world. And so he had the script, Pennies from Heaven. He was going to make it for Columbia. And he went to uh, Harry Cohen, the famously uh, angry <laughs> Columbia president, and said, I want Louis Armstrong. And at first it was like, why? But it was like, listen, we don't want to... We don't want to set off Bing. We'll, we'll give you Louis Armstrong. And so they wrote a whole role. They gave him a song, Skeleton in the Closet. He had a little comedy to do. And it, it set him off and running. I said, 35 films later, you know, this was a big part of his career. And I guess at that time, that was quite a pioneering thing. I mean, uh, in, in a sense, you could argue that Louis uh, pioneered and opened a lot of doors for African-Americans to get into Hollywood. Totally. This is the kind of thing that sometimes we get so uh, caught up in our 21st century ways, because I'm, I'm not going to lie, a lot, of, a lot of people watch some of his 1930s movies and they, they almost cringe because, let's face it, the parts are not uh, Sidney Poitier parts. They are not befitting a genius like Louis Armstrong. They have him stealing chickens in one movie. He's a garbage man in one movie. You know, it's always, you know, he's a stable boy in one movie. It's always pretty bleak. But when I was writing my new book, Heart Full of Rhythm, I spent a lot of time with the black press. The African-American press was following every step he made. And this was front page news. The fact that Lewis was appearing in these movies, he was getting equal billing. He was stealing the movies. People were applauding after his musical numbers. They were uh, laughing at his comedic numbers. He knew that this was definitely a step in the right direction. And so he never apologized for it. You know, you, you can't paint a picture of him feeling sullen saying oh i have to do these terrible demeaning roles this is terrible he knew it was like whoa this has never happened for my race you know i've got a lot of responsibility i've got to do my best and i'm going to reach a whole new audience and he took it very seriously and we have letters private letters that he wrote his friends in the 1930s bragging about how funny he was and how much he loved doing comedy in these movies so if you ever watch those 1930s movies don't feel sorry for him you know they are really groundbreaking works yeah, well, I mean, when I when I watch any Lewis on film, I, I it always strikes me just how completely natural he is, you know, and uh, he just he doesn't really seem to be doing anything other than being Lewis, you know. I mean, that was it. so for those for those that might not know, was when we see Lewis on on film, is that what he was actually really like in real life? Yes, I mean, Armstrong did not know how to fake anything. And I think that's something that drove people crazy because they saw the smile, they saw the teeth, they heard the laughter, and they said, well, that's got to be a persona. You know, nobody can be like that. Yeah. And then, like I said, at the Armstrong archives, we have his tapes, 700 tapes, real-to-real -real tapes. You hear him off stage, you hear him with white friends, you hear him with black friends, you hear him with celebrities, you hear him with musicians. He's always the same guy. He didn't have a switch. He, you know, it wasn't like, you know, he was speaking polished english off stage and then he did this character on stage you know he was completely himself he was so comfortable in his own skin and what you see is what you got now he is a human being so you know he could be angry he could have he could curse up a blue streak he could hold a grudge you know he's he's a human so you know it wasn't like he was laughing and smiling a hundred percent of the day uh but he really tried to give you all you know whether it was a fan meeting you for the first time or whether it was the royal family you know they all got the lewis armstrong that everybody else got that's wonderful now throughout those films and i guess i guess for most of us uh, the well-known ones are things like High Society, The Glenn Miller Story, uh, The Five Pennies. Um, Louis uh, is playing cameos. He's playing himself and their cameo-like musical 
part um, uh, moments, aren't they? Um, how many movies uh, was he given a character name and therefore some sort of speaking role of some sort? It's funny. He actually early on they were almost all character roles. Pennies from Heaven. He yeah. has he has dialogue. Uh, going places with Dick Powell. I mean, it's a full blown you know comedic. And he's funny, you know. There's some definitely some cringeworthy moments in that movie. One character refers to him as Uncle Tom, and you know, it doesn't really hold up. But Lewis's part, he's funny, and he has great comic timing. A uh, Cabin in the Sky, which was a pioneering all black film, Armstrong plays about 20 seconds of trumpet. He's used as an actor, and he's you know, he's got the scene in which he has some of the funniest lines. Uh, New Orleans, uh, he acts in that one. Glory Alley was one of his first substantial parts. But you are right. After 1952, it almost becomes let's have Louis Armstrong show up and just kind of shake things up a little bit. You know, yeah, he just yeah, has to yeah, be himself, yeah. play some music, get on, get off. And, you know, some of those movies, he's still the best part of those films. Well, I mean, to me, probably one of the great moments in film history is on the bus at the beginning of High Society. You know, it's, yeah. it's absolutely glorious. I, 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 I beam with joy every time I even think about it, you know. And that's one of those movies, Yeah, I, I have to tell this story quickly. I, I did a thing with Wycliffe Gordon, the great trombonist oh, in yeah, Chicago. Yeah. And uh, he did a presentation and he showed the, the whole first scene in High Society. And I'll admit, the audience was about 90% African-American. And I started, you know, almost squirming in my seat saying, oh boy, yeah, here we go, because I've seen these criticisms of Lewis on film. And, you know, what are they going to say? You know, he's in the back of the bus and, oh, yeah, there's something wrong here. But Everybody spoke of people in that audience were alive in 1956, and they remembered when that came out. And what did they remember? They remembered that Lewis got equal billing in the credits. They remembered in the movie poster, Lewis was the same size as Sinatra, Grace Kelly, and Bing Crosby. Uh, he entered the mansion first before his white drummer, Barrett Deems. And so there's all these subtle things, and he's carrying the movie. You know, he's, you know, he's the Greek chorus. He's there the whole time, and it's not a subservient role. You know, they were, everybody Everybody in the film respects him. He's like the star. He's coming to Newport. This is a big deal. And that was a real kind of learning moment for me because, you know, like I said, sometimes we get caught up in the stereotypes and the demeaning aspects. But here was a majority African-American audience saying, no, they remember when that film came out. That was revolutionary. You know, there everybody was respecting Louis Armstrong and he held his own with Frank Sinatra, Grace Kelly and Bing Crosby. Man, it was a big deal at that time. I guess it's kind of feel, feels quite strange to think of that movie as being revolutionary for its time, but the way you describe it, it clearly was. Yeah, I mean, these things take time. I mean, you know, if you look at the 1930s African American actors, not just Louis Armstrong, but yeah, Mantan Moreland, and you can go down Eddie Rochester Anderson, you know, and it's like, well, why did they take those parts? You know, well, those were the only parts. And there's some great interviews with Sidney Portia in which he said, yeah, he never held it against those early African-American actors saying that without them opening the door, you know, there would be no Sidney Portia. And, you know, these things took 20, 30 years. It's a shame. I'm not saying that, you know, that was the right thing. It was horrible that, you know, they had to play these roles and that it took, you know, so long before African-Americans could actually get decent representation. Mm. But, you know, it was a long road, and Louis Armstrong was definitely a driving force on that road. Yeah, yeah, hallelujah. Um, so, uh, with reference to A Man Called Adam, which is quite a strange film, I've uh, I've watched it a few times now, and uh, I, 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 I'm never quite sure how I feel about it. But but what were the circumstances that led to Lewis being cast as Willie Ferguson in that movie? Well, I guess they figured, yeah, Lewis is basically playing himself in that film, you know, because we have to consider it's 1965, and, you know, even though Lewis is probably at the height of his popularity, this is right after Hello, Dolly, you know, he is seen... He is seen as a bit of a, a throwback, you know, to the younger African-American crowd. You know, Louis Armstrong was not exactly the, the hippest thing in the world anymore. And so he kind of plays that part, you know, Sweet Daddy Ferguson uh, was the greatest back in his day. And he's seen as a little out of date by, you know, the younger, uh, more militant Sammy Davis Jr. So mm. it made sense, you know, for Lewis just to kind of go in there like nobody else. I, I think the role was written with Lewis in mind. And I, yeah. I can't see anybody uh -huh. else really really pulling that off uh but the film like you said it's an interesting film um it's got every jazz on film cliche in the book <laughs> you know, we've got drugs we've got a you know we've got a little bit of everything in there um 
but it's interesting. I was reading the reviews, and the jazz press wasn't very impressed. Um, yeah, they had this thing in, in that time, of course. We could talk about that. Whenever Louis Armstrong appeared, it was like, oh, yeah. yeah they just didn't want Louis Armstrong anymore, which is uh, a travesty. The film critics, New York Times and all that stuff, they thought it was kind of cliched. I think one of them said five years earlier, it would have been a little more on point. But by 65, 66, it was already seeming a little uh, hokey. But the black press, again, they were big fans supporters of the film because you know you have cicely tyson you have ossie davis you have sammy davis you have lewis armstrong the film was produced by two african-american producers and it, you know, it dealt with these issues and uh they actually very much supported the film and wanted it to be successful so different audiences are always going to see different things but for me it, i'm happy the film exists because it actually allowed lewis armstrong to act again you know, he yeah. had, like you said, he had this run of cameos, which he would come on and play. And he does do a beautiful back of town blues in this film. Um, but you actually get to see him act. You get to see him, uh, you know, act with surprise, act with hurt. You know, you get to see him deliver lines. And it, this film is usually held up as kind of like this example of like, ah, oh, if, you know, it's there. The, the talent is there. The ease is there. The natural ability is there. If only Hollywood gave him a little bit more like if they treated him like sinatra you know if they gave him a starring role let him do some drama uh this is probably the closest we get so we're, we're thankful for that yeah funnily yeah. enough sinatra jr is in the movie isn't he <laughs> exactly and he gets beat up <laughs> <laughs> oh, don't, don't, no spoilers <laughs> no, oh, that's right yeah sorry no. <laughs> <laughs> um it's well documented that Sammy Davis um, was one of the young generation of African-American artists that have been quite vocal in their criticism of Louis Armstrong. Um, could you explain why that was? And do you know what state their relationship was in by the time they came together on the set for this movie? Sure. I mean, Lewis had always been an idol to African-American audiences in the 20s, 30s, through the 1940s. But by the 1950s, as that younger generation grew more vocal, more protests, more demands for civil rights, um, they began looking at Louis Armstrong as something of a relic. You know, he was out there smiling. He was very popular with white audiences. He didn't really want to talk about uh, politics or civil rights or anything. And then when he does, in 1957, he puts his whole career on the line. He criticizes President Eisenhower. He criticizes the whole United States government for the way they were handling the integration crisis at Little Rock Central High School. Hmm. And Lewis hmm. went, I mean, he put his neck on the line and he spoke out for weeks. You know, he just kept on doubling down and doubling down. And to him, this was his big moment. It's like, all right, you want me to speak? Here I am. And what hurt him for the rest of his life is many in the black community criticized him because our, this was a time, you know, we're, we are so desensitized in 2021 where every politician gets beat up. You can pick your network, pick your newspaper, whatever you want. You can find the, the opinion. But in 1957, you know, entertainers and everybody, they always rallied behind the government, rallied behind the, uh, the president. And here's the most lovable popular african-american on the planet saying the government can go to hell and president eisenhower has no guts and all of a sudden a lot of people are like whoa you can't say that and so uh armstrong gets criticized and he gets criticized by sammy davis jr and lewis cuts out the clipping and scotch tapes into one of his scrapbooks so we had that scrapbook at the armstrong archives lewis did not forget uh so having said that I don't know too many stories from the filming of A Man Called Adam, but uh, Jack Bradley, Lewis's good friend, was at the nightclub scenes, which were filmed mm -hmm. at Small's Paradise in Harlem, and uh, snapped many photos. And there's a beautiful photo of Sammy Davis lighting Lewis's cigarette. And they seem, you know, uh, fairly comfortable around each other. Davis did give some quote afterwards about how... Uh, yeah, he meant it complimentary, but it was kind of like, you know, I'm out there, I'm acting and doing all this and doing all that. And, you know, I'm, I'm the star of the film and I'm in every scene. And then Louis Armstrong comes out for one one scene and does one number and everybody calls it a Louis Armstrong picture. Yeah. <laughs> it was something like that. Like he meant it like to praise Louis, but it was kind of yeah. like, all, like, like, you know, hey, it's my film. Um, and while Louis was filming A Man Called Adam, he was honored at Carnegie Hall. They celebrated his 50th anniversary in show business. And Sammy Davis was there and presented him with something uh, but there's there's this tension there in 1970 they both appeared on the mike douglas show and 
the episode survives and on camera they were great but there's a jam session at the end this was after lewis had stopped playing the trumpet so he's kind of singing and scatting and leading everybody and there's eddie miller and there's mike douglas's band and pete fountain and they're all trading but sammy davis jr sings he dances he plays the drums he grabs the guy's trumpet he does some comedy with the trumpet you know he's sammy davis and according to pete fountain's protege tim laughlin a great new orleans clarinetist he remembered that lewis chewed sammy davis out afterwards that you know he was basically hogging the spotlight and you know eddie miller was trying to take a solo when sammy davis was doing this comedy with the trumpet and lewis you know just said that was like the most unprofessional thing so there's definitely some tension there i think they're fine for a man called adam but they're a little cautious around each other probably Mm -hmm. looking at the looking at the entirety of armstrong's film career um do you feel that he was uh as proud of his contribution in movies as he was with his contribution to music early on he was definitely i in 1941 leonard feather asked him to name his greatest accomplishments in entertainment and i think one of the first or second things armstrong mentioned the first thing he mentioned was the fleischman's east radio show which was the first time an african-american hosted a nationally sponsored radio show and the second thing he mentioned were the films and he enlisted pennies from heaven he listed going places and so i think at that time those were such groundbreaking moments and he was proud of it he knew that no african-american had featured billing no african-american hosted a radio show and i'm holding my own with bing crosby i'm stealing the movie he was remarkably proud he didn't even actually name any of his records in that leonard and feather interview he didn't even mention his music it was more of yeah these are my accomplishments later on though i i I do wonder because, yeah, there's a few stories of him on the set. Like he made the movie Glory Alley in 1952 and he had to cancel a bunch of gigs to be on the set and he was playing the trumpet. He was warming up every day to keep his chops up and they would tell him, they would go in his dressing room and be like, quiet, Mr. Armstrong, we're filming. And that annoyed him. He was like, you know, I don't need to do this damn film. (laughs) I'm going to go out and play for the people. And so, you know, I think he enjoyed making the movies and he liked the company of Danny Kaye and Bing Crosby and all that stuff. But Uh, by the 50s and 60s you know i think these were pleasant diversions but he was living for that audience he wanted to be on that stage that's where he was most comfortable now talking about being on stage the other film watershed is showing is uh the iconic jazz on a summer's day uh which was from i believe the newport jazz festival um i think in the opinions of many it's it's one of the most important documentations of jazz on film it's a wonderful document. It's beautifully shot. Um, tell us a little bit about that. So, so when was the festival, and and do you know how it came to be filmed? Well, this festival was the 1958 Newport Jazz Festival. Newport started in '54, and by '55 it became kind of a sensation. And in '56, it's the anchor to the plot of High Society. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. it shows, you know, how quickly a jazz festival, uh, you know, can become part of the public consciousness. So uh, in 58, you know, um, I think one of the Lorillards who were, were the, the, that was the, the, the business folks who put in all the money along with George Ween to produce the festival, they had the idea of filming the festival. And so they hired Bert Stern, who was a great photographer. He's probably best known for his Marilyn Monroe photographs. Mm. And uh, Stern gr- grabbed the camera crew and just filmed like crazy. And uh, he had George Avakian as the music supervisor, and he eventually turned over all the footage to Aram Avakian, George Avakian's brother, to edit it all. And um, it, apparently there was so much to edit. George Avakian, uh, I can tell you, it was a good friend of mine. He was bitter until his grave. He thought his brother deserved more credit because yeah, he said Bert Stern okay. shot it, and he shot it beautifully, and yeah, the film is great. But what you see is Aram Avakian because Avakian was given like four cameras worth of raw footage and basically told, all right, make me a film. And, um, you know, so let's give Aram Avakian (laughs) his due, I guess. But it, it, it finally came out at the end of 1959 or the start of 1960. And to this day, it's known as like the first real concert film. You know, there wouldn't be a Woodstock or there wouldn't be a Monterey Pop and everything else that followed uh, The Last Waltz and stuff like that. I think without jazz on a summer's day. Now, of course, um, Louis was the headliner and um, he he plays and sings beautifully throughout his set. 
Do, but do you know anything about the backstage uh, uh, life there? I mean, did, did do you think Louis had much time to catch up with the, the other jazz greats and his colleagues that were working on the festivals? It's possible, but, you know, to Louis, his whole life was a string of one-nighters. And I know that, you know, the, I think the very next night he was back in New York. Yeah. Um, actually, Jack Bradley's first girlfriend, Jean Fallows, before she started dating Jack Bradley, she was dating uh, a man named Paul Studer, and she had a column in the Hot Club de France Bulletin. And uh, she wrote about this, that she was with Louis in New York, and he had said, hey, we're going up to Newport. You want to come up? And they all rode the bus together. And the way she tells it, you know, they were basically there. You know, I'm sure Lewis had some backstage time, but played the set and then it was right back to New York afterwards. Like it was almost like a, a day trip. So at that time, I don't know how much he had to hang. Um, the previous year, 57, that was an infamous year when George Ween wanted to do something for Lewis's birthday because the festival took place on July 4th and he invited Jack Teagard and Kid Ory and uh, Ella Fitzgerald and all these musicians and he wanted to do a whole you know, birthday tribute at the expense of Armstrong's All-Stars and he never told Lewis about this and then when when Lewis was told he lost his mind backstage and uh, it, it, it was a whole ordeal but there are stories in, of him backstage you know with J.C. Higginbotham and you know with Jack T. Garden and all that kind of stuff so Newport 58 was actually almost kind of like a way to uh, settle the 1957 thing because the 1957 thing got bad press Lewis got bad press it was really kind of a an incident we tell that story now and it's like one of the great stories of lewis defending his band and defending his honor and all this kind of stuff but at the time people were like oh what a temper tantrum what a prima donna <laughs> they, they were they were just out to get lewis no, no matter what he did and so in 58 he agreed to do sunny side of the street with the uh international uh, youth band and then he allowed jack teagard and bobby hackett to come out and we see them in, in mm. jazz on a summer's day and so he was able to have his own friends and you know, do things his own way. But hang time, um, I I think he was there for one day. So any thoughts of him backstage or Chuck Berry and stuff like that, I think we could fantasize, but I have no proof, unfortunately. Not like, it's not like Glastonbury these days where you go and you hang out for the weekend and the, the, literally they were in and out, yeah? Right, yeah. Lewis was in and out. Maybe some of the other musicians, you know, especially in previous years, you know, where you would get, uh, like, 57, Norman Grand's recorded almost the entire festival. And, you know, you get Roy Eldridge for the set, and then Roy is with Basie, and, you know, everybody's kind of, like, sitting in and doing things. Um, that was probably for the the mortals, for lack of a better word. But, you know, Lewis, there was always another gig right around, right around the corner. So, in and out. Now, um, slightly off the subject of Lewis, I, I personally want to give a special mention to those who are about to watch jazz on a summer's day of the absolutely spectacular set that Anita O'Day performs. I think that's one of the most beautiful bits of jazz on film that I've certainly ever seen. So apart from Lewis's performance, do you have any favorite moments from the movie? I mean, Dinah Washington's great. You know, she does this incredibly roaring version of all amazing Mac Jones back there and the Dinah place vibes. That's a lot of fun. And ending the film with Mahalia Jackson, and oh, the wow. Lord's Prayer. I mean, that was, you know, kind of a, you almost say a daring choice because, um, you know, it's billed as this big jazz feature and everybody was at the festival that year. They could have ended it with anybody, but to end it with that kind of like reverential thing, I thought that was a beautiful and, touch. And there's that extraordinary uh, moment of, of Chuck Berry coming. Yeah. Um, and, and, and for those of you that don't know, Chuck Berry's not performing with his band. He's performing with a bunch of jazz guys, right? Joe Jones is on drums from the Count Basie band. You see, you see Jack, Gar uh, Jack T. Garden with the trombone. He, he, I don't think he even plays. He just stands there grinning through the whole thing. Um, and Buck Clayton <laughs> from the Basie band's there. It's an extraordinary moment, isn't it? I love it. I mean, it was one of those moments that the critics lost their minds because yeah. they, yeah, they, they were mad at George Ween. It was almost foreshadowing what, what was about to come because in, in future years, more rock acts and more, you know, non-jazz acts would infiltrate Newport and, you know, eventually, you know, now there's jazz festivals with no jazz musicians, <laughs> but that's, I'm off the subject. But at the time it was like, how dare Chuck Berry come there? But yeah. I think it works great. You know, all these guys had the same language. They all played the blues yeah. and you see, you know, Joe Jones is smiling, Jack T. Garden's smiling. Like they're like, this is different. You know, this guy might be, 
from another planet, but you know, we, we, we can get, get along together. And so I think it's a, it's a fun moment of the generations kind of colliding. Oh yeah. Pretty much the way that it would have been when Lewis first started playing in the early twenties, you know, same thing, same it, thing. It looks exactly. like it comes from another planet, you know? Yep. Yep. Yeah. Um, now you've talked a little bit about Lewis grueling touring schedule. Um, what about as jazz festivals started to gain traction in the late fifties and into the sixties, did Lewis have, uh, appear at many other festivals was that a, a thing that his manager would try to factor him into yeah newport every year he was there uh monterey a bunch of times he was there for the inaugural one later on in 58 about four months later um yeah i mean as long as there were festivals the playboy jazz festival in chicago in 59 uh mm -hmm. they always tried to, to make him a part of it i think he was always happy to be there but um like I said, the festivals were kind of different. Yeah, you know, it's it's one set usually, and especially when there's outdoor festivals, there'd be rain and all this kind of stuff. Um, I think Lewis liked being on his own, doing his two and a half hour show, you know, by himself, doing it on his own terms. Uh, but he made the best of it. You know, it was part of the part of the landscape. And when you consider one of his last big public appearances was at Newport in 1970, when all the musicians showed up to wish him a happy birthday and kind of send him off, I think he was comfortable. You know, he was comfortable in any setting. Yeah, yeah. Um, now, Ricky, I'd like to talk about you for a moment. Um, um, for those of you that can see, if you can see this behind me, I have both of Ricky's uh, biographies. <laughs> And I'm going to I'm going to do a little plug for you. So this is the first one. This is What a Wonderful World with the subtitle The Magic of Louis Armstrong's Later Years. Ricky wrote this in response to an awful lot of biographers. And there are many uh, putting emphasis on Louis's early and pioneering years. Qu I mean, quite rightly, I guess you could say. But um, Ricky picks the story up here when Louis uh, uh, breaks the shackles of, of the big band swing era and uh, forms his All-Stars, which he toured with for the rest of his life, right? And then, albeit retrospectively, the sequel is Heartful of Rhythm, which has come out, was this, came out last year, didn't it? Last September, yeah. yeah. Um, and this one is on the Big Band years, so from 1929 to 1947. And I believe, Ricky, you've been commissioned to write a third retrospective biography. So, so give us a little, um, give us a little uh, plug for your for your writing work, please. Oh, sure. Yeah, no, th this is kind of how the whole thing started, because I, I first heard Armstrong's 1950s music when I was 15 years old, 1995. And it just nothing had ever hit me like that before. So I said, All right, I need to learn everything there is to know about this guy. And everything I grabbed had the same story of don't listen to him in the 1950s don't listen to the all-stars don't listen to the big band you know by that point he's gone commercial he's showbiz he's an entertainer he's a clown he's an uncle tom you know uh, the 1920s that's the pioneer that's the groundbreaking stuff so i said all right and i went back and i listened to the 1920s stuff and had my mind blown of course but i was like why are we disparaging the rest of this guy's career so that was my first thought was everybody's sleeping on the All-Stars. You know, what he does between 47 and 71, knocking the Beatles off the chart, telling off the government, you know, becoming Ambassador Satch and all this stuff. Uh, that's a story. And so I was fortunate enough to turn that into a book, which came out 10 years ago. What a wonderful world. And honestly, I'll be completely honest. I thought I was done. You know, in, in, the, in the ensuing years, I've been fortunate enough to teach, run the Armstrong archives, give lectures, give presentations, go to festivals, produce CDs, all this kind of stuff. But then when I would go out there and meet musicians and talk to people, I realized that, wait a minute, everybody's sleeping on the big band years, you know, because it was part of this thing where Lewis hits its peak in 1928 and everything he does after 28 is kind of, uh, you know, cast aside. And I said, no, that's a story too. And so fortunately I was able to write that story. And so that was 1929. To 47 the first book was 47 to 71 so two-thirds of the story are finished from my perspective i didn't have any uh grand plans to write about the early years because i did figure that those were the years that were the most covered everybody knows the new orleans period i mean he wrote about it better than anybody else with mm -hmm. my life in new orleans of uh, the 1920s with the hot fives hot sevens but i do have access to the armstrong archives i do have 
you know, some incredible stuff, that, you know, interviews, Lil Hardin, Lewis's sister, uh, a lot of the musicians who were there at the time. We have Lewis's unpublished manuscripts. We have the tapes. And so I've now gotten very excited. I think I can, I can add st- parts to the story that have not been told before. And there are certain themes that have crossed both books that I'll now be able to tie into this book. And I think part of the thing I want to show is that there, you can have your favorite period. If you love 1920s Lewis, if you love 1950s Lewis, that's fine. But there is this consistency. You know, the same guy who you saw in these films, smiling, telling jokes, you know, he, he's super funny in, in um, uh, Jazz on a Summer's Day, you know, this rocking chair, he does the interview with Willis Conover, the same guy doing the pop songs is the same guy in the 1920s, you know, who was doing pop songs and doing comedy and doing all this kind of stuff. There is a tremendous consistency. And so if you're always trying to break him up into, the, you know, in this period, he's doing this. And then all of a sudden he makes a decision to go commercial. And then he makes a decision to, you know, whatever. It's all nonsense. And so my work leans heavily on Lewis's own voice and letting him speak for himself, letting him defend himself, letting him explain the choices he made. And so I can't wait. It's probably give me about three years or so, but uh, I'll be able to finish the the backwards trilogy, and um, then I'll retire. <laughs> Just on the um, on the jazz on the summer's day. Um, for those of us that live in England, there's a wonderful moment when Lewis is being interviewed, isn't he, on stage? And uh, and he mistakes. Uh, ch- he, he, he 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 wants to say Charing Cross, but he says Charing Square. And uh, and, and, and when I, I remember when I was a kid, that I, I found that so charming. And then there's the, there's the joke about the weight machine, isn't there? Which you guys are going to see when you watch the movie. It's 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 right. absolutely fantastic. Um, so finally, Ricky, please um tell us a little bit about the work you're doing with Armstrong's music because you're involved in or you have been involved in a lot of re-releases in the last few years. Yeah. I mean, like I guess this whole thing, I, I, I don't want to sound like I'm bragging or whatever, but this is, it feels like I've, every day is a dream because, um, you know, I started out as a Louis Armstrong fan, like everybody else. I've been able to write these books. Okay, that's one thing. I've been able to run the archives. Wow, that's incredible. But something I'm really proud of is I've been the producer or the co-producer of just about every Armstrong reissue in the last 10 years. And so I was Universal's uh, in-house guy. We pretty much emptied the Universal vault. But if you if you know the cheek to cheek Ella and Lewis box set, or there's a Verve box set pops as tops, we did the complete Satchmo at Symphony Hall um, concert, and then there's some streaming things for those who stream. We have the Decca singles. We put out two volumes of that, so that was all for Universal. But the the latest and greatest is Mosaic Records, which is a mail order company. Their stuff is limited edition. Once it goes out of print, you'll never find it again. It's not downloadable. You know, it's physical set, seven CDs. Um, but it's Armstrong's Columbia and RCA recordings from 46 to 66. This is with an emphasis on Louis Armstrong plays WC Handy, Satch plays Fats, The Real Ambassadors, uh, all the great singles, Mac the Knife, Do You Know What It Means, and Miss New Orleans, all that kind of stuff. Mm. And we put it together. Uh, with about three hours of previously unheard material. I wrote a 30,000 word essay. We put in 45 photographs. It comes with a big booklet. And you can only get it at mosaicrecords.com. It's a limited edition, 3,500. As far as I know, the first, I think I heard 1,000 or 1,500 are already gone. So it's going quickly. Um, but if you have any curiosity about, you know, why is this guy talking so much about Lewis in the 40s or 50s? You know, I, I, I didn't think he was that great. Check out the set and, uh, you know, see me in the morning. (laughs) Well, folks, um, enjoy the movie, uh, movies. Um, If you're at one and you didn't know about the other, go and see the other. Go and see both of them. Support the watershed and um, allow me on your behalf to say thank you to the wonderful Ricky Riccardi. Um, that, thank you for speaking to us today, Ricky. And uh, well, let, let's uh, let's um, say now, end of song, beginning of story. Yeah, man. <laughs>